Welcome everyone to the Mapped Out Podcast. I am your host, Michael Patterson. This is episode two. I'm with my buddy and co-host, Michael Shemansky. Let's get this started. Today's topic, second episode, is on a little bit about our history and why we started the Mopped Out Podcast. But before we dive into that, you guys know we have a favor to ask. The favor is if you guys find value in the show, find it interesting, a new topic came up, please share us in conversation. It really helps us out, helps us grow our viewership, and helps us help you guys. So without further ado, let's dive into the history. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm good, good. Wow. Just a little tired. Just good? Just good? Just a little tired, but it's the usual. We're all good. Well... I had an interesting question brought up to me yesterday, and they asked, why did you start the Mapped Out Podcast? And I was like, well, we, we dove into episode one, and we didn't really explain why we started it. And I think before we can understand why we started it, let's dive into a little bit about our past, right? Because you and I both have a pretty extensive history with athletics and, um, and other stuff. So dive in a little bit yeah so um ever since uh i was a kid i was running around as usual you know usual kid stuff uh played soccer for almost a decade me too what what position were you uh, i was a midfielder oh and defender big runner yeah exactly uh came in came on down down the line uh unfortunately not in soccer uh, didn't, that did not pan out that well <laughs> same <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, around the time in middle school, uh, early middle school time, um, that's when my dad first gave me a barbell. Um, so I was doing barbell curls so and, what, and what, benching. What age is that? Like uh, thir- 13, 13 yeah. 14? When I was, when I was 13. Uh, that's when I started lifting uh, weights. Now, I can just see it now, okay? L- little Michael, okay, <laughs> out here bench pressing 225 at 13. <laughs> that's how it started, right? Because that's, that's how apparently if you go on Instagram – that's how everyone starts, you know. Yeah, yeah, instantly. yeah. Instantly, yeah. <laughs> strong as strong as hell. Yeah. So, okay. At that point, I was let's see here. I started cycling cuz I think I really came up in the endurance um part of the wow, I'm already messing up. I came up in the endurance kind of industry where I was I loved cycling and my dad um, got me into cycling, and by the time I was 11, I was doing like 75 miles. And so for me, the transition into the weight room, because I know you did it at a pretty young age, I started probably when I was like 16. Um, and for me, it was actually, a, I think, a pretty big shift because I had to ch- change my whole mentality of how I looked at fitness um, because you can't continuously have those long, drawn-out um, training uh periods wow. yeah training periods and i i would say that helped me um but i'm curious like when you first started out what was that like what were some of like your mentors what was uh what was kind of that that first starting out yeah so it was like the winter um in one of my middle school years can't remember the exact date but um that was around the time when in gym class we were allowed um, access to the weight room that the teachers used. So we started doing, you know, low rows, uh, pull-ups, bench pressing, uh, lots of curls. Oh, yeah, um, curls. And this was, this was the, uh, during the track season. Um, so I was already uh, um, the fastest person um, in, my, in my school um, at that time. And uh, that was just something I stumbled upon. Like I was just – naturally gifted uh my dad was also naturally gifted with yeah. that speed so. so that's what i was also gonna ask so are do you come from like a fitness oriented family yeah so my dad especially yeah he yeah. he um played soccer until he was 28 20, 28 to 30 um wow so. oh, i didn't know that um and he was a sprinter in high school too his okay. he wanted to play football but his mom didn't let him play football so <laughs> um he wasn't wasn't allowed to get hit but so he made up for that in sprinting and he was pretty successful at that um and then also obviously playing soccer 
He was very good at that too. So that okay. So see, I I also kind of came from that. So a lot of our listeners don't have that experience, right? We're because we've kind of been brought up in the fitness and and clean eating and and ex- insert healthy topic here um, lifestyle and what I really noticed was because my parents are divorced right so um, when I was like my mom is probably a little bit more health conscious than my dad um, and I always give him crap about it so I can say that on here but I learned kind of the basics and then once I started getting into like the endurance sports right and I needed that fuel that only accelerated how much I wanted to learn about um, fitness and the topic in general because nothing is worse than when, like, you know, you drink milk and you decide, oh, I'm going to go for a nice long bike ride. And, you know, then a couple minutes down the road, <laughs> you're not feeling too good. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And those are just hard lessons, right? And But I still had that foundation right at home of, like, you know, eat – Get your vegetables in, and I've I've never been a picky eater. Have you been a picky eater? Oh uh, yeah. Um, when I was early, when early on, when I was a kid, I didn't eat any meat at all. Really? Um, only hot dogs. That was about it. So I ate I ate no meat. Um, I did eat liver liver as a younger kid when I was not not fully conscious of eating it. That's probably why I ate it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, I I uh, I was super picky. Um, I had all my food had to be separated on a plate. Um, I only ate things I enjoyed, lots of yogurt, cheese, um, not a lot of green vegetables, lots of fruits, hot dogs. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. Oh, see, I love the barbecue when I was a kid. Oh, you get the grill fired up. You get some, some good meat on the grill. Oh yeah. I, I'm loving life. Yeah. It's the complete opposite now. Like I'm eating, I'm eating uh, swordfish and scorpions and you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So I've obviously broken out of that, but yeah. So how, how did that actually, I'm curious, how did that affect you? Like, did, did you notice that there were any negative impacts from that? Yeah, so um, my grandma always called me skeleton. Uh, oh. You know, that's another story. But um, it was because <laughs> my ribs would always show I was extremely lean and skinny as a kid. Um, so it was probably because, you know, I didn't eat as much as I as I could have. But, you know, I didn't. I was playing video games a lot, not really focused on yeah. eating. I wasn't lifting as much as I do now. Um, I was just playing sports because you know it was fun to do. Um, so yeah, I didn't I didn't grasp grasp nutrition until about my freshman year of high school. So you were ac- you were actively training. Yeah. While still going through that. Yeah. Yeah. And then so then once you un- kind of started to understand nutrition, when did did you see like immediate gains or did you like how did that happen? Yeah. So my freshman year I was about 130 pounds in high school. And by my junior year, I gained 50 pounds. Um, so I was about 180 or so pounds. Um, and I was, I still retained uh, super low body fat. So it was pretty um, insane to say the <laughs> and least. And we'll, we'll go into your, uh, the end of high school for you. Cause yeah. that's, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was pretty crazy. You know, it's not usual for most people <laughs> for that to happen, yeah. but yeah, I was, I went from, you know, Benching 135 pounds as a freshman to, you know, some numbers uh, that were pretty nice for my weight. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, something that's obviously not normal, but that's how it transitioned as soon as I started learning how to eat better. Mm-hmm. So so we're, we'll go back to freshman year right now. So my freshman year, right, I played on I played on soccer team, and I wasn't, like, great by any stretch of imagination. I was, like, average at best. And for me – when I realized that I wanted to switch and I wanted to go away from the endurance, because at that point we were doing running camp and we were running a lot, and I was pretty skinny. Um, I When I decided that I didn't want to do soccer anymore, and I almost got bored, right? Because I was like, man, I'm used to being active, and I still had cycling. But other than cycling, like you can't do cycling in the winter. Okay? Yeah. No, nothing it's not happens. the same. It's not <laughs> no. the same. Like when you're sitting Stationary in your is just not yeah. the same. It's not working. So Even the Peloton. And so where I was, oh, the Peloton. <laughs> <laughs> My stepmom's listening to this going, we have a Peloton, Michael. You can't, you can't rip on it. No, uh, so no hate on the Peloton. But I, I actually fell in love with 
weight training through mentors, right? Um, and so coming out of that freshman year, at this point, you were already in weight training. I just started, and I was 135 pounds, I think, when I started weight training. Um, I was probably more than that. Uh, maybe 140, maybe. Um, and I remember I the first time I walked into a weight room, because our, our high school had a weight room as well, and it was nice. Like, they had just redone it. It was phenomenal. And I walk in there, and uh, one of my buddies just hops on there and rips 135. And I was like, oh, I can, I, I got a plate. <laughs> a plate on each side. I got this. And I go to do it, and it just pff, just fails. <laughs> on bench press, it's hilarious. It's classic. But I had, I was very fortunate because I had mentors that saw that, but they saw that I had the drive to do it. Mm -hmm. And they took me under the wing, and they helped coach me. Do you, did you have a similar situation? Yeah, so... Um Originally, when I started lifting, it was in, during the summer program. It's a pre-freshman year. They um, have it at my high school, Market High. Um, it's like a summer camp where they introduce all the basic lifts and, uh, like, sprinting drills and stuff like that. So the coach at that time was a powerlifting coach, uh, Coach During. Um, he later on coached me um, in my powerlifting career. Um, so, yeah, he realized... Um, maybe the genetic potential, but more so the drive to get better. Um, that's probably the one thing that um, surpassed my genetic potential, at least uh, psychologically in my head, um, because I would just burn myself out to the highest degree to get better at anything. So, um, yeah, he probably recognized that in the summer camp when I failed a couple things. But then I went on to the powerlifting program when I was a freshman in my uh, second semester during the winter um, and that's when things started blowing up um, and obviously that was under his training so yeah and I think an important an important thing we need to note here is if you notice with our stories right people see what we can do now and what our what our bodies look like now because I know you obviously probably have gotten comments about how you look right in a, in a good way um, and I have too and you know, that's that's nice, but there's been a whole process, right? So we're looking at going on six years, at least for me, of training on top of the endurance before that. And for you, you're going on, what is that, eight? Eight years? And you, when those eight years go by very fast, but when you look back, it's like, wow, that, that flew by. But I see how each step compounded because I did well at the, the base, right? Mm -hmm. And then that progressed and that progressed and that progressed to what you see now and I think that's one key point that we want to talk about with this podcast is that don't shortcut it because the foundation that you build as you continue will di dictate how you look how you feel and how healthy you are later on down the line so stretching back so now we're about 16 years old this is when I started really getting into it because I could finally drive and uh and that's when I started going to a a very popular gym for powerlifting, um, and I started to understand. Wow, like there are people moving some weight. This isn't high school anymore. These are like people who have a passion for it, and that's when I got hooked. Um, you're going into June sophomore year is when. Wait, when did you start? Uh, yeah, that would be sophomore year. Sophomore year. Yeah. So, so talk me through. Where did you end up? What What were your end numbers? Yeah, so sophomore year, um, that is when uh, I got off a pretty awful football season, so I was pretty pissed. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to crush this powerlifting season. Um, it went pretty well. Uh, didn't qualify for state, but held some uh, some good numbers. I think I was doing maybe 365 squat and a f uh, f around almost 400-pound deadlift. Um, my sophomore year and then my junior year um, I was I, f I changed positions and I started at cornerback on the varsity level um, then I tore my shoulder in half had to get surgery so I was out for the entire year pretty much until track season came around um, then I got another injury there almost tore my hamstring off um, so then so before you go before yeah. you go there <laughs> that setback right yeah. injuries two setbacks yeah. exactly right and that's <laughs> brutal yeah and a lot of people quit right a lot of people say oh well now my shoulders hurt and I can't I can't do what I used to do 
Um, when you, because I, my friends that have had shoulder injuries, when they go back to like bench, when they go back to do anything, because your shoulder controls so much movement, mm-hmm. um, it it drastically reduces your strength. Yeah. How was that mentally for you? Yeah, it was um, when I finally um, the awful. I mean, sorry, the great trainers at yeah. Marquette High. Um, they took out a long period of time to work with me specifically because um, they knew I was a dedicated person to the sport and I held um, good positions and certain yeah. sports. So there's obviously some potential there, maybe. Um, but they took out a four month process of stretching me out um, three times a week, um, slowly. Uh, Because I was in a sling, so my arm was directly attached to my torso, pretty much. (laughs) So I had to be stretched out um, externally and then upwards, of course, because I never reached over my head. uh, Because I was in a sling for around three months after surgery. Um, And then that, you know, that turned into a seven-month round process up until the track season. Um, But when I did take off that sling finally, and I did my first couple bicep curls, uh, I looked crazily different than like <laughs> what I originally looked like. Obviously I had uh no abs. Uh my arms were very small. Uh my obviously my shoulders were atrophy to the max. Um it was extremely demoralizing, one of the lowest points in my life by far. Um but uh I never I used it to drive me for sure. Like the the reason why I got the surgery was for a reason because I wanted to keep competing. Yeah. Even though the doctor told me not to. Um, so yeah, basically when that occurred, when the sling finally came off, I always focused on taking it slow because y- if you injure the same area more times, then it's harder to repair, um, as I've learned through my anatomy. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I used that as a grounding point to start a journey to beat my personal records, even with an injury, because if I thought if I did that, then that would show that, you know, it is my discipline. It is my effort that's pulling through. And so basically you used it as motivation, right? Correct. And yeah. was there ever a point where you, I, I know there's probably at some points where you thought about quitting, but is there ever a time where you, like, for example, for me, there have been times when, like, I'm sitting in a gym parking lot and it's late at night, and I, I, I've i learned to appreciate those moments now where I sit there and go, okay, I feel like quitting, but I'm not going to, like, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to rock this weightlift session. Was there a time explicitly in your head where you were like, man, I do not feel like doing this today, and you did it, and you're like, wow, that, that, that is what I needed to prove to myself? Yeah, so every uh, leg day in our powerlifting season, every Monday was <laughs> every Monday. god-awful because um, we hit legs so hard because it's a foundational lift in the competition, obviously the squat. You have to hit depth. You have to pause it, so you have to. Everything has to be perfect. So, it um it's a very organized movement, um so you can't be fatigued in any position of it. Um so we trained it extremely hard. Um usually on the last set uh, every every week the last set would be the most weight, but it would also be the most as many reps as you could do, and all the guys would get around. There was eight of us on the team at that time, and we'd all be screaming and playing loud music and stuff and. Basically, we'd go above 20 reps on all of our maxes. We'd just destroy ourselves. And oh, my it was, goodness. It, was, it, was a, it showed you how the mental can overcome the physical mm-hmm. easily when you have support around you, too. And you're now a junior, right, going through all this? Right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, correction, it, was, uh, it would be senior year, year winter. Okay. Yeah. So then... So first semester of yes, senior year of high school. Correct, yeah. So then now you – for me, my, my story is pretty boring from that point forward. Like I, I had some awesome um, some awesome coaches and mentors that, you know, once again saw my drive. And then from there – I actually, you know what? Here's a funny story during that time period. So soft – this is, goes back to sophomore year. The, how I even got into powerlifting. Oh, I didn't even say this story. Okay. So sophomore year, um, at this point you are rock you're you're and you're rocking it right. Yeah. So so for me, I was like, man, what am I gonna do? And my English teacher, he was a uh, Jesuit novitiate, uh, Mr. Farrell. If you're out there and hearing this, like I owe all this powerlifting uh, information to you. But 
I wanted, he was my English teacher, and he's like, he got super excited about powerlifting. And me being the kiss up that I am, I'm like, man, if I join this powerlifting club, like, I can get big, but then also like I get brownie points, and that may come in handy for that for the you know you know those papers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so my buddy Christian and I uh, joined, and it was from that moment forward like I saw how much he cared, and as we progressed throughout you know junior year, um, and as I went on to other gyms, he still like kind of held on and, and talked to me about it and helped me work on my form here and there and said, hey, take it slow, don't hurt yourself, it's not about the weight, right? That's a big thing. It's not necessarily always about the weight. You have to have the form perfect, and it's not worth a big number if you're doing the form crappy. So he really emphasized the importance of form, and that's – so my progress was slow, but it was steady, and I would go in – did you work out in the morning? Uh, Always after school at 3 o'clock. See, I, I loved the morning. Because my buddies, if I was working out at DeSmet, my buddies were would work out in the morning as well. Or I would go to this other gym. And the morning crew is just a different breed. Everyone looks at each other. Everyone respects each other. And you come in, it's like a whole different environment. And I loved it. And that is what really hooked me, to be honest with you. I had good mentors who helped me. And my progress was slow and steady. And then when I'd go to the gym... They were always kind and helpful, and they saw a kid who was there every morning, and they it res- they respected that. And they told me, like, hey, you're in here all the time. We're going to help you out. And they – you got to watch some advice in the gym. But uh, I and, – and that's what made me, like, fall in love and stay disciplined with it. And then, obviously, as you continue on um, into senior – or as I continued on into senior year, you did well. You did as well. Um Talk, walk me through, now you're going into your spring. Because for me, during senior year, this was kind of like a very forgettable period because I wasn't like moving a ton of weight. But at the same time, that was an awesome developmental period for when I got to college and then I started moving weight. So talk me through your spring of senior year. Yeah, so um, around the time of March, um, they hold the state finals for powerlifting here in Wisconsin. A uh, little fun fact, Wisconsin's numbers for qualifying for state are higher than the national qualifier. So by qualifying for state, which is what I did, uh, I automatically qualified for nationals. I obviously didn't go there because that's in Louisiana, so I didn't want to pay to go there. Uh, but that's a side story. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, as the season was going on, um, we had some amazing people on our team. Um, we had four people crack 500-pound squats. Um, and, uh, that's insane. Yeah. So especially at what? 18. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We were, I was, yeah, I was 18. The rest of them were 17. Um, so yeah, we were moving some stuff around, uh, benching around 300s too. So it was, it's a good time. It's pretty crazy to think back on it. Um, <laughs> but honestly, I think it was just the com- camaraderie of us pushing each, each other that pushed us past what we thought we could do. Um, but anyway, uh, as that as that continued in the spring, uh, we all went to state. Uh, we all competed in our separate weight classes. Um, then we got the state title together, um, and uh, we set a new state record for the amount of points that a team can have um, above another second place team, obviously. Um, so we crushed it by like I don't know, like twenty or so points. So like obliterated it. It wasn't even close. Let's go. So that was. Very nice because we all like really liked each other, so it was a nice camaraderie moment. Um, we also had two other two of our teammates uh, break um, American records, so that was pretty cool too. So you you were in a pretty com- like highly, high <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a pretty big group. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, uh, just for reference, we had a, I had a teammate named Javon. Um, he would come to practice twice or twice or so every other week. Um, so not often at all because practice was five days a week, Mm -hmm. um, doing Olympic lifts and and powerlifting at the same time. Um, and he squatted 520 pounds with, uh, Asus is on and no, no uh, belt. So we obviously had some genetic people um, (laughs) in our team. Advantaged people. Yeah. It was, uh, not fair at all. Um, and this is all, uh, raw 
Um, so that means obviously um, we, we mean unfair. You're not saying like it was bad. You're yeah, just saying, like, <laughs> it's just funny looking yeah. back. Yeah. It was uh, it was um, raw competition, by the way, just yeah. for those powerlifters out there. So it's no belt. It's a, a belt and knee sleeves and a singlet. Um, no wraps of any sort or um, smelling salts or any of that yeah. stuff. Just <laughs> um, as raw just means you know with little. So yeah. So okay. It's cool. So now you and that on that note real quick that actually sounds like a blast like now the mentality that i have around lifting like i would go there and and i would probably feel at home like okay this is this is my people yeah i love this energy yeah um so let's now talk about going into college right and and once you got to college what were some challenges because you came in i came in pretty fit and used to go into the gym regularly what about you i take it same Yeah, yeah same yeah yeah so um what was there anything about college that like you're from Milwaukee though Mm -hmm. for me coming to a new city was there anything about college that like threw you for a loop or like challenges that you faced um in terms of lifting or or just just in general yeah around around your normal because typically we are healthy individuals yeah so we have pretty strict habits yeah um what were some challenges you faced like around that? Yeah, I would say uh, the dining hall, um, just oh, the yeah. the desserts, because usually uh, at my house, um, at least we have to like go out to get a dessert. So Ooh, like big dessert guy. Yeah, like I have awful sweet tooth. It runs Ooh. in the it's in the genetics. <laughs> it's in the genetics for sure. Um, some but, people are able to lift a lot of weight. Yeah. My, <laughs> Michael just yeah. loves the sweets. Yeah, my friends would always tell me. Um, anyone who I know knows this is that. Um, they would always get mad at me when I would eat whatever I want and I look the way you do the way I do <laughs> and they would get really mad about that but it's just the, it's just the way it is and it was uh yeah that was tough for me because I really I, I, I cook on the side too I, I bake a lot of stuff and I'm, I'm passionate about like good tasting food so when I so when I when, when I when I I eat the the good food it just uh you know it just hits a nerve with me I like it a lot so then I, I'm like okay let's have it again so that was one of the things I had to discipline myself on and um your freshman year kind of turned around quick. Like I was, I would literally go to the Chinese station, get brown rice and then go to the grill and get chicken and then get some vegetables from the salad bar. And like, I did that for a good month or so. Cause that's what I did in high school. I meal prepped every Sunday. Um, but then I realized, you know, like I can get away with enjoying food a little bit. So mm-hmm. I thought, okay, I'll try this out. And then, you know, I, I found out what worked for me, um, within the limits of enjoying stuff still. So it was kind of a moment of, um, cracking this code of only eating these certain things because that's what makes me look good um but i could just you know try new things that taste really nice um stay below a a certain calorie limit and it worked out for me so yeah i i came in with this notion that because when you go on tours to places okay here's for any incoming college students next year when you go on tours and they give you like the delicious meals of like all these different options, like the <laughs> ne- <laughs> all the all the college yeah, students, the cheesecake are- that never came back. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Um, but that food all goes away, right? So I had this perception that okay, I'll be able to eat no problem, and you add the the dinners, which at that point because this is before COVID, um, you could go and have whatever plate you wanted, and you could just continue and continue yeah. and continue i guess you can still do that now but it's yeah. it's different um and then you add in like second dinner around like 10 p.m because yeah. our dining hall was open yeah and next thing you know that starts adding up and it wasn't like i was gaining weight but i gained i did take back i did gain weight but it was healthy weight because i was like the day that i got to marquette like i was ready to go to the gym and i ended up going to the gym that i currently go to now which is off campus um and for me, that was a big moment, like when I got here and I had to like re like I had to evaluate what I was eating because I couldn't just rely on what you know my parents were making for dinner that night. Um, and I had to just continue eva- continuously evaluate, hey, is this good? Is this bad? And that philosophy of, okay, I have to make sure that I'm doing what's best for me. Um, when it comes to eating and stuff like that really helped shape the way that I trained too, because I was like, okay, I have to, I'm staying disciplined about what I'm eating. I have to stay disciplined about 
going to the gym so that way I can eat what I want. Um, and I don't really – the dining hall food, it's okay. Like, it's not great, but it's not bad. Um, but I never really had the sweet tooth here because, I don't know, the, the sweets in the dining hall still are not, you know, <laughs> gourmet. Yeah. My uh, my training partner freshman year was Andy Scopp. I don't know if you're familiar with him, yeah. but uh, he's in, he's in uh, Coronado now in California yeah. training for something that people may put yeah. the pieces together for. Um, but anyway, I love would, Andy. We would uh, train at uh, seven in the morning, and we'd have a breakfast before that. Then we would eat three more meals between our next training session, that was at four p.m. And then we'd have like two more meals after that. So we we're having around like six meals a day, and that was our routine. Our my freshman year, um, obviously that was crazy because you know, um, you know, Andy, Andy's a uh, training to be a Navy SEAL now, so obviously I was with someone who was very motivated as myself, so yeah. it, was, it was a very fun period of time. But did you, okay, if I did that process now, right, and maybe it's, maybe my metabolism has changed, and I notice now, like I, my diet, called diet, I ha- I force myself to eat three meals, not force, but like that's my diet. I need to get three quality meals, and then, you know, protein, et cetera, and all supplements. Um, but like if I had to eat six meals, obviously they were probably smaller meals or they, were they, yeah, yeah. These were like, these were full black plate meals. Oh my goodness. Like how much time two, did two you cups spend? Of, two cups of rice, you know, like how much time did you spend breasts? in the dining hall? Like usually 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But, but the meals, they would be at the same sit, the same sitting. So it would be like three plates at a time, you know? And I remember when I could do that, no problem. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's just different now that I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not in love with yeah, dining. Yeah, we were hall just crazy. Anymore. It was. It, it might have also been that I wanted to see certain people at the dining hall that I was interested <laughs> in, so I yeah. went more often. But uh, won't put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> okay, so now it goes into training, right? And and because you use, so I don't use the. Do you use the Marquette facility? Uh, I use the Recplex okay, Stras gotcha. now. Um, and I don't. And so how how would you say your training has evolved using going cu- going from your previous um, equipment to, you know, the, the fitness center here? Yeah, I would say um, the biggest change was the mentality, um, more so the, the vocalness of training, not being as loud, being more modest, um, <laughs> not screaming, not stuff like that. Not intimidating everyone. Yeah, like a m- lot more uh, sweatshirts, sweatpants, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. hiding myself um i try not to attract any attention to myself um more so of a personal um relieving of stress rather than pursuing pursuing a goal um i only go there to you know make myself feel better and uh put in effort that will then carry throughout the day as i do other hard activities that's the way i look at it um so yeah i'm usually very quiet some people take it take it as me being pissed off which i learn later on and uh same here yeah it's it's unfortunate because i have a resting you know what face <laughs> so uh it's sometimes it's just hard but yeah I mean, as, as many people know is when they come up to me when i'm training and i'm like not mid-set then i'm like very talkative um but uh yeah it's more so of a personal thing i don't want to talk to anybody not because i don't want to but you know this is the time for me to meditate pretty mm-hmm. much i i actually have the same experience um for me Contrary to popular belief, a lot of the um, quality lifters that I know very rarely like train for looks. If that makes sense, they mm-hmm. do it because it makes them happy. Yeah, and they they have goals, obviously, to look a certain way. Yeah, or to lift certain weights, but they do it because it's like a meditation for them. Correct. And I'm the same way. For me, I can be so stressed out, or I you know I have an exam X Y Z insert here. I go to the gym and I put on, I listen to slow country music um, when I start lifting. I just put on my slow. <laughs> that, honestly, everyone says, wow, that's weird. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. sorry. Um, man, I, I throw on some slow country music and I can just zen out. And I, I also, I just, I'm quiet. I'm not a social, but I, I've turned into a social butterfly. Mm-hmm. Now that people have seen, like, I'm not a rude person. Yeah, yeah. I just don't talk a lot. Yeah. Um, but really just 
I get in my zone and, and just continue on with my lifts. And then when I get done, you know, in between lifts, maybe I'll talk. But when I'm when it's time to work, it's time to work. Yeah. And that mentality re- releases so much stress yeah. because you're not you're not focused on external things. You're focused on your internal brain, how you're feeling, and it and it's something that I had to evolve into. Because when you started out, you, were you pretty external, as um, in like motivators and stuff like that? For uh, just uh, when I was thirteen, or are you talking about in college? high? Yeah, in yeah. high school. Um, when did that? Was there ever a shift? Because I know for me, there was a big shift between I'm not doing this so people think. Because at that point, like you're looking pretty good, and that that why, which we'll get into in a minute, that why changes. Um, and for me, it, it changed from I'm doing this so I can look bigger. I'm doing this so I can appear X, Y, Z. And to, and then it became, okay, I actually am doing this because I want to, because I enjoy it, and because it makes me feel better. And it, that alone will help increase your buy-in and your um, willingness to persevere through the times when you maybe don't want to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. Was there a shift for you? Yeah, it was always internal for me for the in the beginning. Um You're just built different. I wanted I wanted to crush anyone that was playing sports against to be honest and I saw lifting as a way to increase my athletic performance. So the more I did it, um I was very driven. Um obviously there's a limit to it and you can overdo it, but yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I, have yeah. you, have you overdone it? <laughs> um, I think I have once or twice. Yeah. In athletic terms, uh, usually maybe not, maybe like no. too big of arms, yeah. maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> it just looks stupid. But, um, yeah. And then, and then it shifted to external. Unfortunately, when I started, uh, dating people, yeah. um, I noticed that, you know, looking good helps, Sometimes yeah, of with lots of people. Um, in my case, everyone. <laughs> uh, so in my case, everyone. that was uh, that was unfortunate. Um, At least we're in a way you. because uh, I think the internal thing is way more important. Intrinsic drive, um, your own thoughts, and nowadays that transformation away from the external um, motivated, you know, lifting. Now it's intrinsic, totally to the point where when I get home after lifting and I look at myself in the mirror, like I laugh because I'm like so happy. Yeah, that, like I put in the work and I look like this because it, it, I from where I came from when I was a young kid to where I look now, it's just it's uh, it relieved a lot of uh, depressive thoughts and it um, released a lot of motivating chemicals Def- to say the least. Definitely, and I same way. Like I look back at old pictures and I'm like, I thought I was. Oh like, yeah, I thought I was. Oh big, yeah, yeah. Or I thought I was. There's some pictures floating around <laughs> of me. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, it and it, it helps you even on those rough days because everyone has those rough days, right? Yeah, yeah. It helps you, it, and it makes you appreciate, like, oh, I'm actually like doing pretty well, like, and it's it's building that. I'm not saying resume, but it's building that once again that foundation, right? Of like, okay, I look back and and look what I've done. I'm appreciative of of what where I've come from, and that gives you the confidence to say tomorrow's gonna be better. Yeah. Um, and I would also say this too. Um, you mentioned you were doing it external while you were dating, like through the dating scene. Okay. Yeah. Um, would you say, because I have an opinion on this, that now that you've changed it to be internal, that that has helped that situation? Or would you say like, no, there's been no effect or it's like, it's got, or like, what, yeah. how would you? D- um, yeah, I would say I'm way more controlled now for sure. Like, uh, I have little to no interest in that avenue right now. Um, yeah. And in a way, it reinforces those circuits of intrinsic drive because now I'm way more focused on my goals first and, and, that's, and my family first. And honestly, I find, at least through my own experience, when I was focused on the external, right, I, I, I obviously I wasn't feeling as fulfilled. But also, like the caliber of people and obviously I don't like think that there's anybody like different or whatever, but I, I, my relationships are that much better. And I find that I attract, um, like 
a just different people mm-hmm. that fit my goals more. Yeah. And that makes that makes that relationship so much better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and that's like a big thing that I've seen um, from making that switch towards like an internal drive. And it's made me way more appreciative of those relationships. Yeah, I agree. So while we're on the concept of, of finding your why, right? Let's talk about why we started the podcast. Um, I th- I know why I wanted to start it. Um, and I was, I was hoping I could get maybe why you said we need to start this. Um, the reason why I wanted to start it is because I saw that there were, we, we get questions all the time about fitness, you, you name it, anything that has to do with health, we get questions about it. And I noticed I was telling the same people the same thing all the time. And I wanted to, I wanted to actually do something that had real value and use science, which is your forte, right? Um, bring science into the equation, tell people why certain things are good, certain things are bad, and help grow people's knowledge of what it means to live a healthy lifestyle. Because if you go on Instagram, right, you think everybody's lifting 500-pound squats for 10 reps all the time, and then, you know, because that's all they show, right? They don't show the work that it takes to get there. And they also don't show the discipline and all the other things that go around um, looking good, feeling good, but they're more than happy to sell you on the cheats, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, And so I wanted to just be a voice for the normal people (laughs) of just saying, here's how we live a healthy lifestyle. If you think it's awesome and you think you want to follow us, feel free. If you don't, you think something else is more impactful and something else is more interesting, go do it. But I can tell you our philosophy works because we live it and look at us. Like (laughs) we, (laughs) I mean, no one's denying that like we don't work hard for, you know, for our, our fitness and stuff. So, why why did you start or why did you join the podcast? Yeah, so um, ever since I I think it, going back to that senior year time period, as soon as people started seeing those you know, titles and weights and various things that I was winning um, and doing, uh, they started referencing me for you know coaching them in a way. Um, so around my senior year, I started coaching people and. Uh, it was around like three people or so that just wanted to get in better shape, lose weight. Um, and I started to see that my my recommendations were working. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as it pro- progressed into college, I picked up um, around 10 um, college athletes that I coach currently now too. And that was a real test for me to see if I was really yeah. doing well. And um, all of them progressed exponentially actually. So that was very um, humbling to see that, you know, my, the work that I was putting in on the science side of things and the coaching side of things and designing programs and nutrition, um, we're, we're helping people, you know, dominate their sports that obviously I wasn't a part of anymore. So mm-hmm. I used that, that kind of, uh, that kind of hole of that, that I wasn't a part of anymore to coach people that were in that position to do better, um, as, as in the same effort that I would have given. And, and through that coaching, right. I see a lot of people who get really hung up on the big things, right? They, the big numbers and the, they, they see on Instagram, you know, these like just weird exercises, frankly. <laughs> and you're like, that adds zero athletic ability. Yeah. And that adds zero, um, mind muscle connection. Or right? the commonality that, um, weight adds athletic performance. Yes. That, that is not always the case, which is, one of the big things that I stress on and lots of my people. For well, sure. and, and I know at least something in my training that I've started to incorporate is like, I see these people who are teaching people that you need to be like off balance on like these unbalanced surfaces. And it's like, yes, because when you're walking, the ground is definitely going to be mm-hmm. moving. Yeah. Um, and like stability. Right. Mm-hmm. And to me, that is just obviously one thing that I've just seen lately. Yeah. Um, but have, are there any like key elements where you've seen people, um, or just seen just in general, um, like big errors where you're like, people have this common perception of X. And I always have to tell people with my program, like, don't, don't be doing this. Yeah. So focus on something different. Um, the first would be overloading on their carbohydrates intake. 
um, you know, eating a ton, ton of calories mm-hmm. um, because they think that you know the only way to the only way to gain weight is to do it um, in a very fast, quick way to get the fastest results. Um, however, the um, the the commonalities that I see is that when I decrease these calories and I even implement fasting for some of these people, um, they notice that they get bigger way faster than if they were forcing down meals that they don't want to eat rather just listening to their body. And that's, that's probably the number one thing is, um, learning that, okay, you can follow this structure, but it can also be fun at the same time. Like you don't need to eat chicken, rice, and broccoli every meal. Yep. Um, cause that's another story of micronutrient deficiencies and, and we'll get and in, we'll get bone into density all that and stuff, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and then that's probably, for a later podcast. the other thing is, is just, um, you know, thinking that for sport you have to be big. So this runs along the last point, but for, especially for football players, um, as we can see in the NFL evolving with, to a more fast league, not all these players are walking around at 200 plus pounds, more of them are hovering around the 180s, the mm-hmm. 170s, yeah. and focusing more on the agility and quickness. And that's one thing that I implement in all my athletes um, is more so we start every every um, session with, first of all, a dynamic stretch so that we get limber and we can actually move correctly in the right in the right plane of movement. And the, to do the explosive movements such as sprinting and jumping first so that we teach our um, nervous system how to function. And then we translate that strength on top of that. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of a reverse thought of what people would, would rather than just build up the strength and then try to make some dynamic movements. Yeah, and that's when you see those injuries. hamstring injuries and the, the knee injuries yeah. because and your, your stuff body's like used to going pretty slow and then it yes has to go. yeah or or moving very fast weight. Um, but you, all you have to think about is levers and basic physics that you're propelling this. If you're a 200 pound person, <laughs> yeah, your legs. If you're a football player, are probably making up that majority of the weight, so you're not moving a 400 pound thing with that lever you're moving a maybe a hundred pound object which is your upper body in that case um so maybe you don't need to be pushing through 600 pounds in the squat maybe if you do a good full range squat with fast explosive activity yep then that's way better than you know pushing a powerlifting squat save powerlifting for the powerlifters who specialize in that yeah and and i think this all translates back to a, like a normal individual who who doesn't maybe have athletic ambitions but when when it comes time for them to move i maybe you're playing flag football um on the thanksgiving dinner i will post that thanksgiving dinner uh, session right your those movements become so much easier and you feel better and you know sitting in a chair for a while you're excited to get up and move and then you want to move in and that progresses um I know we kind of outlined a little bit about why we're doing this, um, where we we outlined a few more topics, and where we eventually want to take the podcast, right, talk about some more um, information. Is there anything along the lines of um, failure that you've seen in your athletes from a mentality perspective that you're like, I need to tell people, like, this is a great way to think about failure? Yeah, so um, this past year I've been coaching a D1 golf um, golfer um, who's a very high-level athlete, um, and he was seeing that, um, for reference, he won the state title in Wisconsin four years in a row, so obviously he was a very good athlete. Um, but we started seeing that during his tournaments um, he was slipping off towards the end of the tournament, so he was holding the lead, but then things would start to, cr- to, start to fall in place. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Obviously, I recognize that as a mental aspect, not a physical, because he had very good structure. We were on a program. He gained a lot of weight in a good way. Um, his swing was excellent. He was hitting 300-plus yards, over 100 miles per hour, so it was very, very good. His body was there. Yeah, and um, basically what was happening is that he would do bad on a hole, um, which people have to recognize um, all pro golfers do bad on some holes. Yeah. Um, but the difference that separates an amateur from a pro is that they can get over that and then approach the next hole with a certain, you know, Mindset. plan yeah. and how to how to take it. Um, so that was that's where the, the 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 bridge wasn't being made there. So basically what I implemented is that after you would sink the ball into the hole each hole, um, you would erase the pet whatever you just did. So what I said is that you would you dot your golf ball, okay? And every time you look at that dot, 
it's a new it's a new day. Okay, mm-hmm. so when you when you look at your ball, the place on the tee to start. Okay, you're starting. You're good. Whatever just happened before, doesn't matter. It's a new hole. Okay, let's go. Okay, drive the ball. Then when you get into the hole, pick up the ball, see the dot, thank yourself for what you did, assess yourself, and then it's over. Okay, it's a new hole. Let's start. Go again. So we took that that one hole approach. And then this uh, past weekend, he t- plays top five in a tournament that was uh, tons of Division One schools in uh, South Carolina. So obviously that method of reassessing after every hole, but then clearing your mind, um, making that short-term memory more accessible, um, worked. So yeah, that's an, just an example of something I implemented. What what a great trainer, Michael. Man, we're helping produce <laughs> results. Yeah. So guys, you guys want to be a D1 athlete? Call <laughs> yeah. Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Still taking offers. <laughs> um, and I think as we start to kind of close this podcast out, um, I think we outlined a lot about our past and why we're doing this. But I think there's one key aspect as we go to close my, that Michael pointed out, and that is – recognize your accomplishment right that happened but that it's in the past right and whatever yesterday whatever happened before it happened okay what do i have to do today right i have to eat clean i have to sleep well this is in for normal normal people not d1 golfers um i have to eat clean right i have to sleep well and i have to maybe train and consistently going through that process day after day after day of saying, okay, maybe I messed up yesterday. Okay. So because I messed up yesterday, I am going to recognize that, appreciate the fact that I, that I know that I messed up and then I'm going to use that knowledge, right? And just say, okay, today's a new day. I'm not going to let it hang up and I'm just going to perform and execute today, execute tomorrow and continue. And when you do that over a long period of time, you end up miles ahead of where you were. And that's how you end up looking different. That's how you end up feeling different. That's how you end up building the blocks um, that it takes to win. Yeah, so that's a great, great, great quote there. That was very, very nice, very nicely said. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I mean – my cornerback coach, he was an ex-Marine, and he always said, uh, make a list of small wins, small Ws. And you got your, your L's, you got your small Ws, and you make them up for the day. And then you can say, hey, look, I got this many Ws. I did good. I got something right today. Okay, so that means tomorrow I can get some more. And then you just build up, you know, that, that, that consistency. And in your brain, you might notice that you, it, your head hurts. You might feel annoyed at times, and that's that that hurting sensation is your your neurons reorganize, and that's that's just telling you, hey, you're doing something that that's challenging. But as soon as soon as you you keep on doing that, the consistency builds, the neural circuit gets smoother, and then it's just reflexive. So that's the whole point of all this. And that's how you build the life of your dreams. Correct. Have a good one, guys. Give us a like, and hey, join us for episode three coming later on. Appreciate it.